This is a Scream Queen production. I'm Jen Carpenter, and this is So Dead Podcast. Hey guys, happy True Crime Tuesday. Today I've got a little bit something different for you. I thought with how doom and gloom everything is right now that we could all use a good survival story. Why I picked this one, I don't know. I am terrified of airplanes, so I can't really explain why I keep putting myself in the position to have to research plane crashes in depth, but here we are. Last year, I covered the crash of Northwest Airlines Flight 255 in Detroit, and I am not going to lie, the first time I flew out of that very airport after the episode, which it was a few months, the episode came out in June, we flew to Florida in November, I was a nervous wreck, like I could not get that imagery out of my head, and I decided that researching plane crashes was a bad idea for me. And yet, here I am getting ready to tell you guys about Austin Hatch, the University of Michigan basketball player that survived not just one plane crash, but two. Walloon Lake is located in northern Michigan, up near Petoskey and Charlevoix, two of Lake Michigan's most popular beach towns. The glacier-formed lake spans over 4,000 acres and is up to 100 feet deep in some areas. The water is so clear that in the springtime, after the ice melts, you can see the bottom of the lake at depths of 30 feet, which is just incredible. So don't dump your bodies there. While Walloon, pff, while Walloon Lake has its own little, I can't talk. While the lake has its own little village of year-round residents, the area is mostly made up of cottages, vacation homes, and condos. In fact, one of the cottages on the lake, known as Windermere, was the childhood summer home of Ernest Hemingway and served as inspiration for the backdrop of many of his stories. That cabin is still owned by the Hemingway family to this day. Another cabin on Walloon Lake, built in the 1970s, belongs to the Hatch family of Saginaw, Michigan. Stephen Hatch was born on September 30, 1964, in Saginaw. He attended St. Peter and Paul High School in Saginaw, where he was an all-state wide receiver and graduated near the top of his class. He was homecoming king, naturally, and his high school sweetheart, Julie Sewick, a cheerleader, was homecoming queen. After high school, Stephen went to Alma College, where he played football and got his medical degree, and Julie went to the University of Michigan. After college, Stephen and Julie got married and started about raising a family. Their first child, a daughter, Lindsay Catherine, was born on September 9, 1991. Their son, Austin James, was born a few years later, on October 18, 1994. Their third and final child, Ian Michael, who his mom called Mr. Big, was born on May 6, 1998. The family settled in Fort Wayne, where Stephen worked as an anesthesiologist and started his own practice with a partner, Pain Management Associates, where they treated burn victims and cancer patients. The children all went to the prestigious Canterbury School, Fort Wayne's top private school. Lindsay was a gifted student who danced with the Fort Wayne Ballet. Austin was also top of his class and a talented athlete who excelled at basketball especially. Little Ian, or Mr. Big, loved airplanes, dinosaurs, and his dog Amelia. Mom Julie settled into a life of volunteer work. In her free time, she liked to garden and travel, and she was known for her big heart and her even bigger smile. And Dr. Hatch? He loved to fly. He was a licensed pilot with his own plane, a single-engine, six-seater, 1990 Beechcraft Bonanza. The family had their vacation home on Walloon Lake, as previously mentioned, so they were really, truly... Just live in the American dream, whatever that is anymore. In 2003, Lindsay was 11, Austin was 8, and Ian was 5, just starting kindergarten. Over Labor Day weekend, the family flew to their Walloon Lake cabin, as one does when they own airplanes and vacation homes. 
The drive from Fort Wayne to Walloon Lake takes almost six hours, but the flight takes less than an hour. So when you've got your own plane at a private airfield and you don't have to go through TSA and walk a mile to your terminal and then wait for hundreds of people to load the plane before you can get on, I'm getting anxiety just thinking about it, you guys. Um, when you don't have to do any of that nonsense, you don't have to arrive three hours before your flight. You just show up, hop on the plane, and go. So it was a quick trip by air. The doctor, his beautiful wife, their three perfect children, and Amelia the family dog spent the weekend boating, skiing, swimming, relaxing, hopefully just having the best time together. Because during their return trip home on September 1st, 17 years ago today, actually, uh, tragedy struck. About 8 o'clock that night, Dr. Hatch radioed Fort Wayne International Airport to report he was low on fuel. Moments later, his plane broke through the clouds 15 miles south of Fort Wayne, clipped a utility pole, cutting electricity to the nearby homes, and then exploded into a fireball on a country road in the town of Uniondale, Indiana. Dr. Hatch had time to toss eight-year-old Austin, his co-pilot, who was seated beside him in the jump seat, from the burning plane through the window. After getting his son to safety, Dr. Hatch went back for his wife and two other children, but the plane was engulfed. 38-year-old Julie, 11-year-old Lindsay, and 5-year-old Ian were killed in the crash, along with Amelia the dog. 38-year-old Dr. Hatch and 8-year-old Austin were taken to St. Joseph Medical Center in Fort Wayne, both father and son suffered serious injuries, but they survived. A plane crash. According to the official NTSB ruling, the crash was caused by the pilot's inaccurate pre-flight planning, which resulted in an inadequate fuel supply and subsequent fuel exhaustion. Factors associated with the accident were the low ceiling, dark night conditions, and the utility pole, which the plane contacted during the forced landing. Dr. Hatch opposed the ruling, saying that the plane was not out of fuel, it malfunctioned, but the NTSB stood by the ruling and Dr. Hatch was ultimately held responsible for the plane crash that killed his family. Their physical damage from the crash paled in comparison to the emotional damage, obviously. The Hatches went from a family of five to a family of two in a matter of minutes, but Dr. Hatch and Austin were determined to overcome their tragedy. And they did. Dr. Hatch went back to practicing medicine, Austin returned to school and basketball, and a couple years after the accident, Dr. Hatch found love again with Kimberly Neal, a single mother with two teenage daughters and a young son, also named Austin. Dr. Hatch and Kim were married, and they actually adopted each other's children. So there weren't just two Austins in the house, there were two Austin Hatches in the house. And that's confusing. Uh, the families blended together seamlessly. They all got along really well. Dr. Hatch and Austin healed as best they could. The doctor even started flying again, eventually. And that sounds crazy, right? Like, why would you? How could you? How do you not only travel by plane again, just in general, but how do you fly a plane again after a plane that you were flying killed your whole family. It, it sounds insane, but people do it. People involved in fatal car accidents don't start traveling by car, right? And I guess that's not, I don't know, it's comparative and it's not because we've got to use cars to get places. We don't have to use airplanes, even though they're, they're faster and more convenient in a lot of cases, but yeah, still. Um, so he didn't just start flying again. He actually bought his own airfield, when Fort Wayne's Smithfield Service Center and Flight School started having financial trouble and was about to go under, Dr. Hatch stepped in and bought it to save it. Dr. Hatch and Austin were best friends, closer than father-son, closer than brothers, closer than buddies. They were each other's world, and they spent all their time together. They threw themselves into basketball. They played together every day. Dr. Hatch was at every game, every practice, and he wasn't one of those overbearing sports parents, you know, screaming at the coaches. He just liked to be there. He had his coffee and his Wall Street Journal, and he would just sit in the stands and smile. He just liked to watch Austin play. He was so proud of him. He would often tell him, be an uncommon man, Oss. I would say that as survivors of a plane crash who went on to thrive and find happiness again, they were both pretty uncommon men. 
By 2011, his sophomore year at Canterbury, Austin was a beast. He was six foot six, 215 pounds, and a standout on the varsity basketball team. He was so good that he caught the eye of the coach of the only college he was interested in playing for, the University of Michigan. Austin's mother and both of his grandfathers graduated from Michigan, and his father took classes and taught there for a time. In February 2011, Michigan's head coach, John Beeline, attended one of Austin's games and watched him score 30 points and 16 rebounds against one of the area's best schools. A few months later, on June 15th, the first day that universities could officially make offers to rising juniors, which I had to look that up because I'm not really a sports gal, a rising junior is someone who is getting ready to go into their junior year. Coach Beeline called the Hatch home around 2 p.m. that day, and he offered Austin a scholarship to the University of Michigan. Austin accepted on the spot. His father was, of course, overjoyed. Kim Hatch called Austin's favorite pizza place, 800 Degrees, and made a reservation for their whole family to celebrate about a party of 30 people. Dr. Hatch was in such a good mood, he bought dessert for the entire restaurant that night. There were other big things going on in the Hatch household as well. Maria, Stephen and Kim's eldest daughter, was pregnant with her first child. They were so excited to become grandparents. And Kim, a devoutly religious volunteer, organized a relief trip to Joplin, Missouri following the May 22, 2011 tornado that destroyed the town and killed 161 people. Kim and her fellow volunteers were gone for a week and made plans to go back once a month as long as their help was needed. So, lots going on. Dr. Hatch was supposed to go on a trip to Spain that summer to celebrate his parents' 50th wedding anniversary, along with the rest of the family, siblings and cousins and aunts and uncles. But after Austin's offer from U of M, Dr. Hatch decided to skip the trip to Spain and celebrate Austin instead with a trip to their cabin on Walloon Lake. On June 24, 2011, nine days after the call from Coach Beeline, Nine days after that big old pizza party at 800 degrees, the very day that Kim returned from Joplin, 46-year-old Stephen, 44-year-old Kim, and 16-year-old Austin Hatch, along with their two dogs, Allie, a Sheltie, and Brady, a Labradoodle, arrived at Smithfield and boarded their single-engine, six-seater Beechcraft Bonanza. The same, the exact same type of plane from the crash in 2003. They boarded the plane about 5.30 p.m. Usually, Austin sat beside his father when they flew, and when I say usually, I mean always. It's where he was the night they crashed in Uniondale, Indiana, and it's where he'd been every flight since. But this day, he wound up seated behind his father instead, with big, goofy Brady drooling in his lap. The hatches were destined for Walloon Lake. That's a 50-minute flight. According to the flight plan, Dr. Hatch originally planned to land at Boyne City Municipal Airport, the airport nearest Walloon Lake. During the flight, the doctor requested to divert to Boyne Mountain Airport due to weather. A thick fog had settled over much of northern Michigan, leaving visibility at about a mile, which is basically zero visibility in an airplane with how fast those things move. As their similar names might suggest, the two airports are only about five miles apart, so there wasn't a a huge improvement by the time he got to the second airport. So, about a half hour after his first request to reroute, Dr. Hatch radioed again after missing the approach at Boyne Mountain Airport and requested to land at the Charlevoix Municipal Airport instead. But he missed that approach as well. And then things went very wrong very quickly. At 7.35 p.m., Two hours into what should have been a 50-minute flight, witnesses saw the plane break through the clouds at 200 feet, well below what the airport allowed, and heard it increase power as it turned left, then right, apparently in an attempt to circle back to the runway. The engine sputtered, the plane stalled, then entered into an uncontrolled descent before crashing into a garage in a residential Charlevoix neighborhood. A witness raced toward the crash, yelling, Can you hear me? As jet fuel poured down the driveway of the damaged home and into the street. Austin had been partially ejected from the plane and was critically injured. Dr. Hatch, Kim, and their dog, Allie, were all killed upon impact. The family's other dog, Brady, was missing. Rescuers found him the next day, six blocks away, 
completely unscathed. The NTSB later ruled that the crash was caused by the pilot's inadequate airspeed while maneuvering at low altitude, which resulted in an aerodynamic stall. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's decision to not execute a missed approach and weather conditions below minimums. So, for the second time, Dr. Stephen Hatch was deemed responsible for a plane crash that killed his family. Only this time, he wasn't around to dispute the findings. Austin was airlifted to the Northern Michigan Regional Hospital in Petoskey, then transferred to Munson Medical Center in Traverse City. Calls were made to family in Michigan, Indiana, and Spain. Could you even imagine getting that call? Eight years after a plane crash that killed three members of the Hatch family, now you're getting a call saying that they've been in another plane crash and they're all dead again, except for Austin again. I mean, I can't even, I can't even fathom it. Everyone made a mad dash to Traverse City to be by Austin's side. Luckily, several members of the family were at their own cabins and cottages on Walloon Lake when the crash happened, so there were a few people that were able to get to him pretty quickly, while for others, it took hours or even days to get there. His friends came, his basketball team, his coach. Austin's high school basketball coach drove 11 hours round trip every day for weeks to visit him. And the University of Michigan's basketball coach, Coach Beeline, who just days earlier had offered Austin the future he'd worked so hard for his whole life on a silver platter, watched from the sidelines with a heavy heart. Austin's prognosis was grim. He had a fractured skull, two punctured lungs, a broken collarbone, and several broken ribs. Most concerning was what doctors called a diffuse axonal injury, an often fatal head injury that causes swelling of the brain. In a case as severe as Austin's, of those who survive, 90% never regain consciousness, and the other 10% are left severely disabled. So, if he lived, and that was a big if, there was basically a 100% chance that Austin would never make anything close to a full recovery. He was in a coma for two months before being transferred to the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, one of the best in the country. He did regain consciousness, but his damaged brain just couldn't make his body work. He spent months relearning how to walk, talk, eat, everything. He had to learn it all over. And then in October 2011, four months after the plane crash that killed his parents, Four months after doctors said that he probably wouldn't survive, and if he did, he would most likely be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life, Austin Hatch returned home. He walked through the front door unassisted, and he climbed the stairs to his second-floor bedroom. Still, he had months and months of therapy ahead of him, and no parents to help him through it. His mother, his father, and his second mother were all gone. Unbeknownst to Austin's eldest sister, Maria, who was three months pregnant with her first baby at the time of the crash, their parents had named her Austin's legal guardian in the event that something happened to both of them. So when Austin was discharged from the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, he went to live with Maria and her family. He returned to high school in the fall of 2012, over a year after the accident. It should have been the start of his senior year, but instead he was enrolled as a junior. He rejoined Canterbury's basketball team as a player-slash-assistant, but he did more assisting than actual playing. Coach Beeline made it clear that if and when Austin was ready to go to the University of Michigan, the school would still honor his scholarship and he would have a place on the basketball team, whatever that looked like. As Austin's friends prepared to graduate and go off to college, he began to struggle with the fact that he had a whole nother year of high school to complete. Now, Austin was such a good student before the accident, he actually had enough credits credits, credits, to graduate with his friends, but he was not ready for college, obviously, so soon after the accident. His family wanted him to take things slow. Uh, he was still going to physical therapy, working with occupational therapists. He had tutors, personal fitness coaches, and still, basketball and athletics, which had always been like second nature to Austin did not come easy. Not anymore. So the family decided that rather than allow Austin to complete his senior year at Canterbury feeling left behind, resentful, and depressed, he needed a change of scenery. 
So he went to live with his uncle Michael, his dad's brother, in Pasadena, California for his senior year of high school. In August of 2013, he enrolled at Loyola High School in Los Angeles. Austin joined the basketball team there, but again was more of an assistant than a player, which was so frustrating. He'd recovered from his physical injuries mostly. He could run drills, make baskets, and do all of the things he'd done before during practice when he had time to think about what he was doing. But games move quickly. You have to think and act at the same time, and Austin's brain could not keep up with his body. He had to think about things, make deliberate moves, plan ahead. There was kind of a delay, I guess you'd call it, in the way his brain processed information now. So it was very hard for him to think on his feet the way he needed to to play basketball. On January 8th, 2014, Austin scored his first game-time basket following the accident. His team had a big lead, so there was no pressure. A teammate passed him the ball, and he had time to think about what he was going to do with it. He stepped just outside the three-point line, fired, and fucking made it. Nothing but net. A perfect shot. Austin graduated from high school in 2014, a year behind schedule. He started his college career that fall, and on December 9, 2014, his family watched as he took the court as a University of Michigan basketball player for the first time. Number 30, to be exact. He did it. Austin scored one point as a Division I basketball player during his freshman season, and then after that he took a medical red shirt, so that ended his basketball career, but he stayed on the team as a student assistant. He graduated from the University of Michigan in April 2018 with a degree in organizational studies, and he immediately moved into a corporate career with Domino's Pizza. He married his college sweetheart, Abby Cole, a star volleyball player for U of M in June of that same year. They held their wedding at the Walloon Lake Country Club near the vacation home his family treasured so much and not far from where the Charlevoix accident took place. Today, 17 years to the day after the first of two plane crashes that Austin Hatch would survive, he is 25 years old, living in Ann Arbor with his beautiful wife and their dog. He works full-time as a motivational speaker, and after some light Twitter stalking, it just looks like he has the most beautiful, full life. After researching a story so heavy, seeing pictures of him and his wife and their friends, just so, so wonderful. I, I definitely, definitely needed that. I, I cried so many times working on this episode because it was just so tragic. So to see him now and see him happy, uh, it definitely made me smile. According to MIT officials, the odds of surviving a plane crash where there is at least one fatality are 1 in 3.4 million. But what about someone who survives two? Here's what Austin had to say about that. The odds of surviving two fatal crashes is 1 in 11 quadrillion and 560 trillion. That's a 14-digit number. Roughly 120,000 times the world population. So, you get the point. We do get the point, Austin, and the point is, you are freaking amazing. And that is the story of Austin Hatch, the boy who lived. Thank you for coming to my dead talk. My primary sources for this episode were an ESPN article written by Elizabeth Merrill in 2011, an ABC News article written by Dana O'Neill in 2015, and an MLive article from 2012. You can find my full list of sources on the page for this episode on the So Dead website. Now, I want to tell you guys something about this story. The story that I set out to write and the one I wound up writing are actually two very different things. I knew the broad strokes, right? I knew that a rich doctor killed his entire family twice by being a careless pilot, and his poor son that survived both crashes was destroyed physically and mentally. And it is a fact. Dr. Hatch was responsible for both crashes. Should he have been allowed to keep his pilot's license after the first crash? Should he have wanted to keep his license after that? That's not for me to say. But in doing my research for this story and watching recent interviews with Austin, my opinion on the situation changed. 
bad judgment and careless planning when it came to flying aside, every article, story, everything I found about Dr. Hatch, he just seemed like an amazing, generous, wonderful man and role model for his son. And Austin? His dad was his hero. His dad still is his hero. So it didn't feel right to tell the story in a way that insulted his father's memory, which is kind of the way I thought this was going to go uh, before I knew everything. Well, I don't know everything. I might know everything. You, you know what I mean. The life that this young man has built for himself, despite everything he's been through, is just incredible. It's inspiring, and it makes me feel like a huge asshole for all of the complaining I do about small things, honestly. So, for once, mark it out on your calendar. There's no bad guy in this story. Just a whole lot of good people that had to deal with some really shitty circumstances. And here's something weird. In the So Dead history book, we have now covered two plane crashes. Well, I guess three, because there were two crashes in the Hatch family. But in the first plane crash, the Northwest Airlines Flight 255, the only survivor was a little girl named Cecilia. And Danny has a little girl named Cecilia. In the Hatch crashes, both of them, the survivor was a young sports nut named Austin, and I have an Austin who has always been obsessed with sports. Baseball was more his thing than basketball, but he, he loves them all. I just thought that was a really weird, weird detail. All right, so time for me to do something I haven't done in quite a while, so bear with me. I want to send a huge thank you to everyone that's left a review for So Dead on either Apple Podcasts or Facebook since the last time I did this. I used to do these once a month, but then there was the hiatus and a few super long episodes that didn't leave room for much else, etc., etc. So I won't promise them monthly anymore, but whenever I do do them, do do them, I will pick up from where I left off the last time, whenever that happens to have been. So, from Apple Podcasts, thank you, thank you, thank you to Mike 110793, Lizney Kate, Ova Queen 2, Ajax 241, Osti with three eyes, Sabri 229, A Maxon, Elena MM 223. This one's not a word. I tried to think of what it might be. It's just a bunch of letters, so I'm just going to say the letters. It's like one of those passwords that you're given when you are at work and you lock yourself out of your computer and you call corporate and they reset your password and it's just a jumble. That's what this is. It's a uh, J B D C S A I C S. If you have any idea how to pronounce that, certainly let me know, but I don't think there is a way to do it. Lib Lane and Jennifer R. You guys rock. Thank you. And from the So Dead Facebook page, big thanks to Brooke Wells, Rachel Paxton, Kaylee Leiby, Kayla Christine, Katie Tippett, Samantha Rademacher, and Ashley Simon. If you would like to receive a shout out on So Dead, all you've got to do is leave a review on Apple Podcasts or if you're a non-Apple user like myself on the So Dead Facebook page. Now it's time for me to answer a listener question. This one comes from, I don't know how to say this. It's a, it's an Instagram handle. It's Trikatetri, Trikatetri, Trikatetri. I am not real sure. Um, but they asked, how do you decide which stories to cover? That's a, that's a tough one. So, you know, there are still some stories on the list that have been there since the very first list that Danny and I made together before the podcast ever even started. And then I've got a list that's like two pages long of fan suggestions. I've started digging into some of those. Um, when it was Danny and I, we chose stories, obviously, where we could find two stories that kind of complemented each other and had similar themes. So that was really kind of the deciding factor back then. Now that it's just me, it's kind of like the wild, wild west over here. I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> First and foremost, and this is kind of a weird time for me to say this because today's story is pretty recent, but I much prefer to do older cases. The older, the better. Uh, I try to find new material as often as I can, so stories that either haven't been covered by another podcast or haven't been covered a lot. 
if I do cover a popular case, I try to find a new angle or a different aspect so that there's a reason for you to listen to the So Dead version of it. Um, I guess a good example of that would be, you know, the Bath school bombing that's pretty well known. It's been covered lots of times, lots of ways. So we hit it from the angle of, you know, crimes involving criminals with the last name Kehoe, because we've got a lot of those in this area for some reason. My thought is kind of if someone's already done a wonderfully researched, beautifully covered episode on the case, why would I redo it and just give out the same information again? I wouldn't. I would just tell you to go listen to that podcast. So if I can't bring something new to the table, I'm not going to do it. And that's why you haven't seen me do kind of the big ones like the Ypsilanti Ripper or Eileen Warnos. I probably will cover them in some way someday, but I've got to find my own way to do it. Aside from that, the research material has to be available. A lot of times there are cases that I'd like to cover, but there's just not enough out there to fill a whole episode. And, I mean, it's got to be something that holds my interest, right? I'm the one that's got to research it, write it, record it, edit it, re-edit it, listen to it again to make sure all my edits were in the right places. So to do all that, I, I've got to be into it. So, got to be a Michigan story or have a connection to Michigan in some way. Bonus points if it's old. Even better if it's not a well-known case. And it's got to be something that I would want to listen to myself. So, now that we've got all that sorted, it is time for me to bid you all adieu. Uh, the Festival of Oddities is this weekend in Charlotte. I cannot believe it's just a few days away. I hope to see some of you there. Bring your masks, wash your hands, don't come if you're sick, don't be an asshole. You know the drill. We're all trying to live through this pandemic together, so let's do that. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube at so Dead Podcast. Please check out the Patreon page for ways to support the show financially. You can find that at patreon.com forward slash so dead podcast. And be sure to visit so dead podcast.com for all of your so dead merch. As always, you can email me your feedback and story ideas to so dead podcast at gmail.com. A new episode is coming your way in a couple of weeks. If you need something to listen to between now and then, be sure to check out the Serial Killer Chronicles, my first so dead miniseries if you haven't. Or join the Patreon party as a $5 up patron to unlock all of the bonus episodes that you never knew existed. There are, I think, like 11 of them right now. Um, and then there's a new one every month. Stay safe, stay sane, and until next time, keep shining, you magnificent what the fucks. 